to Psalm 36 tonight, Psalm 36, and uh, we will begin our Christmas series next Sunday, but this message will tie right into where we're going throughout this holiday season, throughout these services, and there are many, many occasions of the next few weeks uh, for you to invite people to church, and they will have a good reason to come. There's something about the Christmas time that brings people back to church or to church. And those who would never darken the doors on a normal week and a normal Sunday will during the Christmas season. And if they're going to go to church somewhere, then let's see if we can invite them to come to First Baptist Church. Or we'll be faithful to share the gospel, and we'll see what God will do. And we're blessed to have visitors this morning, and, and God is gracious to us. We're going to see what God will do as we preach and help and reach this community. And our goal is to do this, to plant and to water. It's God who gives the increase. We have to do our part. We plant and water. We faithfully pass out tracts and knock on doors and witness and share the gospel. And often, God lets us see the increase, and that's exciting. Is it not? To see someone trust Christ as their Savior, see someone come to church, to see young people get baptized and old people get baptized and come involved, and you see growth and transformation. That's exciting to see what God's doing. And when we see the increase, we get excited. But I know, I know two things. One, I know that our responsibility is not the increase. I don't ever want to force the increase just to have increase. God gives the increase. His increase is what, is what counts. And I know that when he increases, boy, it is just life-changing. It's exciting. And, number two, I know this, that whatever we get to see on this side of heaven will be nothing to what we get to see on the, on the other side. I know that when we get to heaven, when God pulls back the heavenly curtains and says, well, this is what I was using you for and doing through you, we will be astounded and amazed and humbled to think that God would use us in any way, shape, or form, and he is working all these things for his honor and for his glory. But our part is to be faithful, to be committed, and to water and plant. So make sure you do that. You grab some tracks, grab some Christmas information, invite your coworkers, invite your friends, invite your neighbors, invite your family members, and give them the gospel, invite them to church, and we'll see what God will do. And uh, I think he'll be, he'll be pleased with our effort. All right? And I'm excited tonight, of course, again tonight to have Pastor Let and Chrissy back in church. They're over there. You can go, just look over there. Just turn, you guys will just turn and look. And uh, Pastor would hate that. And so he's going to be all, all embarrassed about this. But uh, I'm the pastor here. I can do this if I want to, right? And, uh, <laughs> but we are so thrilled to have them in the service. Thank you for being careful around them uh, and not to, to share your wonderful germs. We're a very sharing church. And uh, including in germs, and so let's keep that to ourselves right now as he continues to heal. And you pray for them both for strength, for healing, and uh, boy, just ask that God uh, would continue to work in that situation. But Pastor, I'd love to have you back here, and so glad Christy you as well. God bless you guys. Well, Psalm chapter 36 tonight, Psalm 36 in your Bibles, as we look at what God has for us. There are times in this world it is hard to make sense of what we hear and see. Look at the news, and you read articles, you read accounts, you read stories that will literally knock your socks off. You read accounts and stories of, of things that people will do, and you're like, what is going on? How could they even think this is a good idea? Forget the wickedness eating Tide Pods. How could we think this is even an idea? And yet, if that was all that was happening in life, I think we could handle that. Yet it's not, is it? We open up our phones, turn on the televisions, and see what's going on, and we see where their marriages are being destroyed, and countries fighting nations fighting nations. We find people fighting people. We find uh, grievous acts against fellow human beings, against children, against adults. I read a few news articles to bring tonight. These are all from Michigan. But in the past week, an altercation between two men led to a fatal shooting. The thing that two people could disagree, and it ends up with one killing the other one. In this article, the one man who shot his friend, who was a friend for many years, called himself in and said, We were arguing and I shot him. His friend died at the hospital. What's going on? I-94 this past week, uh, a woman was stabbed after a road rage incident. Another place in southwest Michigan, five arrested 
guns and drugs seized. Two people in Lansing charged in a homicide near a library. Forget your quiet voices. Put another sign, speak quietly and don't kill someone. A coach had a plea deal for driving super drunk. I don't know what super drunk is defined as. Little drunk, medium drunk, really drunk, drunk drunk, and then they're super drunk. He pled to super drunk. We look around and it doesn't take a rocket scientist, doesn't take anyone with half a brain to realize culture's broken. It's messed up, isn't it? People are hurting, they're confused, there is wickedness, there is evil all around us, everywhere we look. And not only do we see it, it is often glorified and magnified. It is lifted up. Things that we would, had never spoken about publicly 15 years ago are now paraded for all to see. Decency is what's under attack, it seems. Morals. If you have a belief, if you have something that you hold to, then you're the wicked one, you're the deceived one, you're the one that's in the wrong. And yet we look at our, around us and we can scratch our heads and we can have a variety of reactions. We can hunker down and say, oh boy, I remember when I was young. We can do that. We could live in fear. Say, my, my, what is this world coming to? We could go in a soapbox and just shout and yell and pick it. We could look at the Bible and see if the Bible makes sense of it all. And I suggest tonight we look at the Bible. How does that sound? In Psalm 36, we're going to see a passage of Scripture that I believe will shed some light and some help especially as we come into this Christmas season. I forced tonight during the message, there'll be two numbers up here. The question is, what's the answer? Two. Six. Eight, right? What's the answer? My friends, we don't know the answer unless we know the problem. Right? We could guess all night and you could be convinced that you are right. But if you don't know the problem, you'll never get the answer. And that is the pandemic that we are facing in this world. Where everyone seems to be guessing at the answer. But they don't know the problem. And they say the answer is this. Listen, the answer is to increase surroundings. And if someone is in a better surrounding, then the answer will be they'll be a better person. But they don't know the problem. The answer is just to accept everyone. And if you accept everyone, then no one will feel slighted. And if, and if that happens, then there'll be no problems. You see, we don't have the right answer because we don't know the right problem. So let's look at Psalm 36 and see what God has for us tonight. Beginning in verse number 1. The transgression of the wicked saith within my heart that there is no fear of God before his eyes. For he flattereth himself in his own eyes until his iniquity be found to be hateful. The words of his mouth are iniquity and deceit. He hath left off to be wise and to do good. He deviseth mischief upon his bed. He setteth himself in a way that is not good. He abhorreth not evil. Thy mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens, and thy faithfulness reaches unto the clouds. Thy righteousness is like the great mountains. Thy judgments are a great deep. O Lord, thou preservest man and beast. How excellent is thy loving kindness, O God. Therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. They shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of thy house, and thou shalt make them drink of the river of thy pleasures." For with thee is the fountain of life, and thy light shall we see light. O continue thy loving kindness unto them that know thee, and thy righteousness to the upright in heart. Let not the foot of pride come against me, and let not the hand of the wicked remove me. There are the workers of iniquity fallen. 
They are cast down and shall not be able to rise. Lord, as we look at your word tonight, I pray that you would illuminate our hearts. By your truth, you'd help us to understand not only what the problem is, but who you are and what you offer. And Lord, may we be encouraged tonight, may we be challenged tonight. But Lord, may we be moved tonight. And Lord, in our spirit, may we be moved. May we be moved to embrace you, embrace your truth. And Lord, may we be moved to have a passion for those who don't know you. And Lord, we ask that as we plant in water, that you would give the increase. And Lord, if you let us see it, we'll praise you. And if you don't let us see it, we'll still praise you, Lord, because whether we see it or not does not determine your working. But Lord, we love you. And we pray for you to work tonight. We'll give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Tonight I want to describe from this passage what the psalmist says, what David says the problem is. This, these two numbers is not, are not original with me. He's a law professor who for more than 20 years at the University of Pennsylvania, he started his first day of class for the law students this exact same way. He said that they would argue about the answers for a while. These very bright minds in his class the best of the best of those in law school, and they all sought to be right in their own eyes, arguing amongst themselves, convincing or attempting to convince other students that they were right, hoping to gain the appreciation and admiration of the professor, showing that what they were doing was the right method and thereby passing his class. Yet, he would always say this, all of you failed to ask the key question, what is the problem? And he said this, unless you know what the problem is, you cannot possibly find the answer. And we must admit that in this world, many people don't know what the problem is and aren't asking what the problem is. But they're offering solutions, are they not? Pay it forward, they say. Show a little act of human kindness. Pay it for it. Pay it for the car behind you. And, and there are stories of where people would pay for the coffee behind them for hours in a day. And the, the feel-good stories on the news. And boy, the, 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 the baristas at the Starbucks that I read about, they were so touched by people's kindness. And, and, and thinking that if we just pay for someone's coffee, that this world will be a better place. Now, on a purely logical side note, it's absolutely true. If you pay for someone else's coffee, the world is a better place. I wholeheartedly endorse that. But to think that the wickedness of this world will stop, that shootings at a library will stop, that people getting stabbed on I-94 will stop, that, that a fight between two friends will stop, because you bought someone a coffee is ludicrous. You could buy a thousand coffees, a million coffees, and you won't stop the wickedness, will you? Help a family in need in the holiday season. And you know what? That is a wonderful idea, is it not? To help those who are perhaps less fortunate or have less. We are blessed, are we not? I'm blessed, you're blessed. We have not just what we need, but we have way too much. We have more than we need and more than we can possibly be responsible for. God is so good to us, materialistically speaking. And it is right, it is good to share those material blessings with those who aren't blessed the same way. But to think... That if I buy a few Christmas presents for some children, which is a great idea, I'm not saying that's a bad idea, to think that if they have a good Christmas, that they will then grow up to be a prosperous member of society is nuts. I wish it worked that way. I wish that for every Christmas present given, that another person would live for God. If that were the case, you know what we do this holiday season? Help me, you know what we do? We'd hand out Christmas presents all over the place, would we not? The issue is that we're trying to solve a problem of a solution without knowing the problem. And right here in the passage, David alerts us to the problem. Look, please, in verses 1, 2, 3, and 4, where David says, this is the problem. Verse number 1, the transgression of the wicked saith within my heart. 
that there is no fear of God before his eyes. Interesting construction of this verse and how the the psalmist writes and, and pens these words. But what he is basically saying is this. When I see the wicked... And I see all the things around me. And, and we look at this world and we say, boy, it's just a bad place getting worse and worse. Understand that thousands of years ago that the saints of God were saying the same thing. All right, They're saying the world is a bad place. It's getting worse and worse. And it's not going to get better until Jesus Christ comes back. But what David is saying here is that I look around and I see the wickedness. He goes on to describe in verses 2, 3, and 4 what that wickedness looks like. Instead of turning away from evil, they embrace evil and they, and they love these things. And, and how they talk and, and what they do and how they flatter and what they say is wicked. But he says in verse 1, when I look around and see, and see the wickedness, the only explanation that I can see the problem is that there is no fear of God in their heart or before his eyes. Or in essence saying, listen, the problem is not environment, not a circumstance, not a situation. The problem is a lack of a relationship with God. Or the answer is Jesus Christ. Because the problem is that people are broken without Jesus Christ. And no amount of political change will solve the issue because the issue is not politics. And we can debate and go back and forth and, and vote. And we ought to vote. We ought to vote by our faith. I am for that. I'm for supporting candidates who line up with our faith. I'm for all of that. But that's not the answer. Because that's not the problem. The problem is they're broken because they don't have a fear of God before their eyes. Or they don't have a walk with Jesus Christ. And the answer is Jesus Christ. What we have is what every single person needs. You say, Pastor, you get kind of worked up about this. You get worked up because we get so comfortable as Christians. We come here and we smile in church. And I'm glad you smile. I'm glad, I'd rather you smile than frown. Well, some of you frown. Some of you frown. You frown when you sing about victory in Jesus and joy of the world. You're still frowning the whole time. And uh, maybe just a frowning person. But, but, but you smile in church and you sing. And, and I'm thankful for that. And you pray and I appreciate that. My friends, we have the answer. Just imagine, just imagine that you had the answer and the cure for cancer. Just imagine that you had that. And that you could cure everyone's cancer just like that. And you had found the answer and it was free. You developed it, you discovered it, it was absolutely free. There was literally no cost. It is would be as simple as drinking a sip of water. And what kind of human being would you be to sit in your house and enjoy being cured but watching people all around you die? What kind of human would you be? You would not be nominated for a a peace prize, would you? You would not grace the cover as a person of the year. You would be like those who have run the pharmaceutical companies and they are price gouging perhaps on on different shots and things like that. That everyone gets after. Boy, how can you charge $600 for this shot when we find that it costs 33 cents to make? And yet we'll get worked up about big pharma and sit idly by with the greatest answer to life's problems. Jesus Christ. And yet Jesus Christ is as simple as taking a glass of water because he said, I am the water of life. He that drinketh of me shall never thirst again. You see, the problem, when we understand the problem, David clearly says the problem is a God problem. It'll never be solved by paying for a cup of coffee. Never be solved by a Christmas gift. It'll never be solved by cutting grass at a house. It'll never be solved by a kind act. Those are all good things. But that's not the answer because that's not the problem. The problem is a lack of relationship with Jesus Christ. Not only must we understand the problem, 
We must understand who God is. Look, please, in verses 5, 6, and 7. If you underline in your Bible, some people do. If you have a digital Bible and you highlight, I'd like you to highlight or think about highlighting a few words. I'll point them out as we go. Verse number 5, there's two words. The first word is mercy. Thy mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens. The second word, and thy faithfulness reacheth unto the clouds. Mercy and faithfulness. Look at verse number 6. Thy righteousness is like the great mountains. In verse number 6, thy judgments are a great deep. And one more, O Lord, thou preservest man and beast. In verse number 7, how excellent is thy, here's the word, loving kindness, O God. Therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. Here in these three verses... We have these characteristics, these character qualities of God himself. You see, we find out the problem is a God problem, and the answer is a great God. Christmas is a season of choice. If you need a blender, and you were to plug in blender into the Amazon app, it would come back with... Let me check here. I have an answer here. Just a second here. 5,000 types of of blenders. Any color, any style, any power you want, any amount of reviews you like, 5,000, just for a blender. A hammer? You want a hammer, do you? 7,000 options for a hammer on Amazon. Oh, but that's nothing compared to socks. I put in socks in my Amazon app before church tonight. 68,000 results. And my page will only display like 14. I could scroll till Jesus comes back and not run through socks. Socks for men, socks for women, socks for boys, socks for girls, athletic socks, dress socks, cotton socks, wool socks, hot socks, cold socks, long socks, short socks. Like a Dr. Seuss book all over Kate right now. My goodness. Do not like that. I better stop. I better stop. My goodness, choices can be confusing, can they not be? They can be overwhelming. Last night, we went out to, uh, uh, to watch a play, and on the way there, we stopped at Yogurt Yeti. You've been to Yogurt Yeti, you go in there, you get yogurt, and then you get all these toppings, and they're in these display cases, and my kids are running through it, my wife's going through it, and uh, here's the problem. They put all the things there, and this is how you pay. They weigh it. It is the scheme. I, I mean, I wish I'd thought about this thing, because they have them all there, and they all look good, Right? You know, and so then my wife's asking the lady, can I have a little bit of this blueberry stuff? And, I mean, the lady's a genius behind the counter. I mean, I don't know if she has a college degree or not, but my wife's like, a little bit, and she's like, plop. Because you know what? She just made an extra 35 cents, and a little bit of this, plop. I mean, it's like, I mean, it's coming out like this, and my goodness gracious. Choices are overwhelming. What do I do? Which one do I buy? And, and what happens is then people then relate that to God and think, boy, uh, there's all these choices with God and, and I can choose whichever way I want him to look and, and he can be this way and I, maybe he's this way or, or I can say yes to all or no to all. And the fact is, God, all right, the choice of God is not what he is like, but who he is. All right, we don't get to define God. He defines himself to us. We don't get to scroll through options. Which God do I want to follow today? We get to choose whether to follow the God of the Bible or anything else. And this is the God of the Bible described in this passage by these words. Number one, mercy. The Bible says his mercy is abundant. Here it is, O Lord, thy mercy is in the heavens. The idea is as you look up in the clouds and you see the stars and the vast expanse and you know that you couldn't possibly jump that high and it goes on forever and forever. It just goes way out there. You look at the stars knowing that we can never travel that far. That's how high and how big and how abundant God's mercy is. So no matter how wicked someone is, God's mercy is greater. No no matter how often they sin or we sin, God's mercy is greater. His mercy is abundant. His faithfulness, the verse says this, reacheth unto the clouds. Or your faithfulness is clearly demonstrated and seen. You know, we can look around in this lost and dying world, this sin-cursed world, and still see the faithfulness of God. You know what we know? Tomorrow, if the Lord tarries, the sun will rise. It will. Why? Because of God's faithfulness. 
And when the sun rises, you know what will happen then? It won't get any warmer. Sorry, it's Michigan. But our feet will still be planted on planet Earth because gravity will still, will still be in effect. And that shows God's faithfulness. And until God comes back, there will be seasons, winter and harvest. The Bible says all this. That's a clear display. And that's what the psalmist says. I can look out to the clouds. I can see God's faithfulness. I can tell others, listen, that's how faithful God is. You see that big orange thing in the sky? That's the sun. And that shows God's faithfulness. A mind of Lamentations, chapter 3. This I recall to my mind. Therefore have I hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Not only do we see his mercy and faithfulness, the Bible then says his righteousness and his judgments, or his virtue and his decisions. His virtue is established like a mountain, or it is unshakable. God's virtue cannot be changed. And I love the description that the psalmist gives to us, that David gives to us here. That I look at that mountain and I could no more move that mountain than I could shake the virtue of God. His virtue is unshakable and established. His judgments, decisions are wise and just. And his goodness, his loving kindness is unmatched. You see, God is greater than any problem we have in life. God is greater than any problem your neighbor has in life. God is greater than any problem the car behind you at Starbucks has in life. God is greater than any family who is struggling to make ends meet for Christmas. God is greater than any problem they have in life. God is greater than the two men who had altercation God is greater than the lady who was stabbed on I-94. God is greater than the problem in Lansing at the library. God is greater, and his character is clearly displayed. So what do we do? What do we do? Well, verse 8, 9, and 10 describes what happens when we lock in and embrace who God is. Look here at verse 8. They shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of thy house. And thou shalt make them drink of the river of thy pleasures. For with thee is a fountain of life. In thy light shall we see light. O continue thy loving kindness unto them that know thee and thy righteousness to the upright in heart. God is sufficient for everyone. He's the answer. A few years back, kids in our family, we went on a trip. Part of the trip was all you can eat. It was on a cruise. And uh, you may not know our family well, but if you were to know our family, you would know that we eat a lot. My wife's skinny little thing, she can out-eat. Well, the rest of us really in the house, to be honest. Um, <laughs> years ago, she came to me, can I, can I tell the story, honey? I probably shouldn't tell the story, but now I will. <laughs> no, it's not a bad story. She came to me and she goes, you know, honey, I think I want to lose a little, little, little weight. I'm like, honey, you're fine to lose weight. I said, but I'll get you set up on this app to track. So I gave her a MyFitnessPal. The first day she punched in what she ate and I got home and she goes, this app is broken. I said, honey, I find it hard to believe. I don't think it's broken. But she goes, it's broken. It said I ate 6,000 calories today. Now daily, recommended daily uh, amount is 2,000. I said, honey, that's what you eat every day. Really? Oh, yes. <laughs> you eat that and you will stay the same size. I think about that and I gain a pound. We can eat. We want this all-you-can-eat cruise. And I tell you what, we ate and we ate and we ate until we could eat no more. We're like, oh, man, I am stuffed. And here the psalmist says this. They shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of thy house. When you taste of God's mercy, you're abundantly satisfied. You know, I, I, I have so much of it, I, I can't possibly get any more. I'm, I'm so full. When you taste of his faithfulness, of his virtue, his decisions, his loving kindness, and we, and we must 
encourage and invite and implore those around us to cherish and embrace who God is. You see, in a world that's changing as rapidly as ours is, it's encouraging to know that God never changes. Someone said this, if the 1971 Volkswagen Beetle, the love bug, little Herbie, you with me so far? If that had advanced as rapidly and as far as a microchip had advanced since 1971, in the same way, this is what the specs of this current, now 2023, VW bug would have. You ready for it? Somebody figured this out. It would be able to go about 300,000 miles per hour. It would get roughly 2 million miles per gallon of gas. And it would cost you 4 pennies. They, <laughs> the Intel engineers went on it to discover that if that gas efficiency went the same as microchips, that you would drive your entire life on one gallon of gas. That will never happen, by the way. I'll tell you that right now. See, we live in a world of change. Yet we love a God who doesn't change. Who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Whose mercy is still new today. Whose faithfulness is still great today. And it will be new tomorrow and great tomorrow. Whose virtue will still be there tomorrow. And we must cherish and embrace and implore and challenge others. In fact, the psalmist comes here and he finishes up about having the wicked stop and turning toward God. You see, we must decide whether we're going to follow the path of those who don't have a fear of God or, will, or whether we will become full of who God is and filled with what God gives. You see, we find who God is and what he gives and we can be satisfied forever. Four and two are just numbers. They're meaningless without the problem. And life is meaningless without knowing Jesus Christ. And if you know Jesus Christ, you have found the answer. You found the answer. You've unlocked this secret. You've, you've unlocked it. And let's make sure that we're living inside of that and we're telling others about it. A little boy hadn't said a word for six years. One day, his parents gave him a glass of hot cocoa. He looked at his mother. He said, Mother, this hot cocoa is terrible. His parents immediately jumped up and down and said, Oh, my goodness, son, you can speak. This is wonderful. Wow, they're celebrating and they're, they're cheering him on. And they asked, Why did you wait so long? And the boy replied, Well, up until now, it was okay. <clears throat> but now it's terrible. And I wonder when we get to heaven if we'll have to answer the question why we waited so long. There's a preacher. His last name was Heber. He was a pastor of an Anglican church. 1811 to 1821. Pastored his father's church. And during that time he wrote 57 hymns. He longed for his hymns to be published, but they wouldn't publish them. He longed for them to be adopted, but the church at that time did not sing hymns in worship. So in 1821, Heber packed away his hymns and sailed away as a missionary to India, where he labored for a few short years and then passed away at age 42. After his death, they uncovered some of these hymns. Many of them you will not know, but there is one that you will know. It's one that we sing here at First Baptist Church. One that I love, and I'm sure many of you love as well. Taken from Isaiah, the hymn is holy, holy, holy. 
Lord God Almighty. Early in the morning our song shall rise to thee. See, one thing Heber got right was the fact that the answer to life was God. The answer to all life's problems is God. But I wonder how often we waste our time making up our own answers, trying to feel good, trying to help those around us in ways that aren't going to help because we haven't answered the right problem.